Hey, this is John Campbell from Lamb of God, and you're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. Hi, and welcome to ForBassPlayersOnly.com. I'm John Liebman, founder and first baseman. You know, a lot of people think they're too old or it's too late for them to learn how to play an instrument. So I created ForBassPlayersOnly.com for people over 50 who want to play bass. Because I believe you're never too old and it's never too late to experience the joy and the pleasure of making music. For BassPlayersOnly.com. That's what we're all about. We've got a very exciting guest this week, John Campbell, bass player from Lamb of God. How are you, John? I'm doing great, man. I'm, uh, <laughs> I just hit that uh, 50 mark plus this year. So, uh, you know, it's a pleasure to be here yes. with all the old rockers. There, there you go, old rockers. Well, I know you've got a lot going on, and you've got a new album, and your tour, and all that stuff. If we could, I'd like to go back a little bit to the earlier days. You're originally from Virginia, is that right? Well, personally, I, I was born in Alabama when my dad was down there going to grad school as part of the GI Bill before going to the D.C. suburbs, okay. getting out of high school and ending up in Richmond, Virginia, which is where uh, the band uh met and formed okay i want to get to that but can we go back just a little bit further what about your musical upbringing and your surroundings and what attracted you to the bass uh musically uh my parents were always playing music as a kid in the house i, I remember uh I'm old enough to remember my like my first real memory of a concert was the beach boys in 1976 on the mall in dc I was three and a half. <clears throat> I only remember little little snippets of it. Uh, but that is the first time I remember being held up and looking across a crowd and seeing people up on the stage making this music that I had heard on the radio so many times. Um, then my dad also had a guitar and, and it turns out a few other instruments that at uh, one point he, he uh, rather than having me mess up his guitar, uh, he had an old baritone ukulele that he had had in college. Uh, and played on and that was that was my first really having an instrument in my hands where it was there for me to pick up when i wanted to play it and put it away when i was done with it what kind of stuff did you play on it uh i was just learning chords <laughs> and just strumming chords and uh and uh i guess i he i think he gave me a a song book and i, I don't remember what songs were in it but there were it was like old timey old Tommy. <laughs> okay you, you mentioned the beach boys I, i've seen them a few times and uh one thing that's really cool about a beach boys concert is hearing like 10 or twenty thousand people go Ooh. <laughs> yeah. and it's really eerie yeah anytime I, that's one of the magic things about playing and performing in front of big crowds is is there's an energy and a personality to a crowd that is it's it's an interesting psychology that thankfully most of the times goes really well yeah or i used to go to the uh, i'm from detroit so i used to go to the red wings hockey games and then in between plays or whatever they'd play the beatles so you know, how could i dance with another then they turn it down and you were right. <laughs> yeah, yeah everyone connecting with that brief little musical statement that everyone knows yep yep but um, I want to ask you about your influences because I know I, I heard you say at one point you were uh, you you were into punk rock. So does that mean like Mike Watt or you know Sid Vicious or you know were you into uh, well as as far as specifically bass players uh, I was more into it, it was more into to bands and and really the scene around DC the the suburbs of which I was growing up in the DC hardcore scene which was dominated by Discord Records. Then there was a New York hardcore scene, which some of that bubbled down and then stuff happening on the West Coast. This is back in the days before heavy metal and punk rock were uh, really uh, friendly with each other. There was actually a bit of a schism that thankfully uh, came to an end with a few records with the help of bands like Suicidal Tendencies and DRI and, and others. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about the band. First of all, I, I got to ask you, Burn the Priest lamb of god what what is behind those names was, was there a statement you were trying to make <laughs> something you wanted to say <clears throat> well keep in mind that there are there's more than one person in the band uh and so it's very difficult to 
not only agree on these sorts of things, but then what it kind of means to each individual is, may be different. And then it really, ultimately, it doesn't matter. It, we're not we're not in the business of creating proper nouns, although I guess technically we are with song names. But really, it's it's a sonic thing that we do. So I, I'd I spent some time frustrated in the name change. I didn't want to change the name from Burn the Priest to Lamb of God because I thought Burn the Priest was the sickest heavy metal band name you could ever come up with. Uh, and it, where did that come from? Oh man, I'm I'm that was that came from. I, I think it was Mark or it was. Uh, friend of ours who said uh, i don't even know where it came from at this point it's been so long because we started in the end of or the end of 94 uh and we had the name fairly early on um people mistook it for a satanic reference which it was not it was just a uh, black sabbath uh you know it, having dark religious uh uh imagery in your in your nouns was cool and and, and this was at a time when heavy metal was not cool like this was 94 nirvana was top of the charts grunge was everything and don't get me wrong i absolutely love that stuff i came up in that era and, and Soundgarden has a lot of uh influence on on heavy metal um but as i ramble i get further away from the topic that you uh that i first started on no it all it all ties together it, it makes sense i could see how people would come to that uh oh the, yeah that, of... <laughs> that, well the, and i don't know if you've seen the original burn the priest um record cover it was uh, uh artwork by the guy who's been doing our covers forever and still does ken adams uh it was a a, a cartoon of a of a bunch of nuns with a priest tied to a stake and they're putting the torch to the they're putting a torch they're in line with torches and they're putting the torch to the bonfire for this priest uh and another side little trivial note uh, that'll never matter but the first logo which kind of looks so, somewhat asian uh, was Bob Gorman from Guar, who's also from Richmond and good friends of ours. He he did that design for us so many years ago. Wow. Let's talk about Omens. That is the the newest album. And I you know I've every time I see an interview with you or read something about you, you say very genuinely, I'm really excited about the the latest and the newest thing. <laughs> I think is a is a great position to be in, a great way to feel. Um, <laughs> Tell me, I have some questions, but to tell tell me what you'd like the people to know about Omens. Omens, uh, yeah, this is uh, what, what really stands out about this record in our, now we've made a few records. Uh, we track this live, um, which is, I guess, kind of how they did it back in the day. But uh, what, what we had grown accustomed to was everyone having their own like we spent a lot of time in the rehearsal space doing the pre-production and coming out with the the tempo maps and like our scratch tracks to then take into the studio where we can be independent. We already like, and you leave that set in stone. Whereas this, we get to kind of set the the vibe for the feel of what's happening, mostly with the drums, but there would still be sections of the strings that were there uh, that ended up in the final recording because we would then go clean up our tracks and stuff. But it was really about getting that initial feel so that uh, we could try and capture some of that live energy, some of the band energy, rather than a bunch of well-machined parts that fit together incredibly precisely, which has its value too. That's just how we've always done it up to that point. We're like, you know, let's do that. Let's do this differently. I'm glad you mentioned that because that was one of the specific things I wanted to ask you about. You remind me of how, how the Beatles, or every time I see an interview with Paul McCartney, he always says, I don't want to do what we've already done before. I want to do something different. And and uh, the two, I think, with Year Blues from the White Album, and they all just got into the studio together in the, in one room together, and they all played. And even things like the cover, like Sergeant Pepper, how much thought and time and energy went into the cover after they did that. The next album, you know what the next album was after Sergeant? I was the, was it the White Album? The White Album, of yeah. course. That's as far away from uh, you know, <laughs> designing the cover as you right. Can. Well, you put so much, you put everything of yourself into what you're in at the moment, and especially in our situation, you never know if it's going to be your last. Especially given our history and the very beginning of like we started at a time when heavy metal was like it was not anything marketable. So we're definitely not doing this to be successful on a business level. And yeah, it's 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 been crazy. But from a creative level, and with uh, boy, you. You've certainly beat the odds of how, <laughs> with, as far as longevity goes with a band. 
So I guess every time you come out with a new album, there must be something maybe even gnawing at you in the back of your mind saying, all right, how are we going to top this? What are we going to do next? Any yeah, yeah. thoughts on that right now? Uh, not at this point in that we are, uh, we've gone through the process. It's buckled up, strapped in, and we are now on the touring side of things. But, uh, you know, as I was telling you at the beginning of this, I, I'm just getting a new setup for myself. So uh, for the first time in way too long for many terrible reasons, but I'm hoping to be able to start to contribute to that more. But it's it really comes down to Mark and Willie uh, and their insane talent and drive to to. I mean, th those guys have home studios where they're tracking ideas for completely different things that, that aren't necessarily Lamb of God related. Hmm. Coming up on 30 years, do you, do you ever play something and say, you know what, either this sounds kind of like what we did way <laughs> or or deliberately. Let's let's. I mean, sometimes, out. sometimes, yes, New especially at this point, because we, I, I feel like we've one of the things we want to be is is dynamic and that we don't want to be. Uh, I'm sure the haters would would disagree. But what we're doing from our perspective, we're changing up approaches and different things and um to be able to do that is great. And then now that we're looking back, like we have records that are like, oh, this is the best record they ever did. And like, well, you know, what if we had like some, a song that had kind of that ashes feel to it, or this riff that kind of harkens to this, but it's not, you know, just kind of the feel of a thing would be the discussion in, in trying to, and trying to come up with new stuff or not necessarily directions, but uh, you know, at this point we're lucky enough that we have had a career long enough that we can look back and, and refer to ourselves because definitely in the early days, it would be, you know, let's play uh, that Slayer riff twice and then it'll change over to the Megadeth riff for like half and then back to the Slayer before going to the Megadeth for the full one. What about performing live? You know, if you're going to play some new stuff and then some old stuff, do you go into old mode and new mode or do, do you just play? It's the performance mode. It's performance mode at that point. And, and it's just, you know, the more time that you have performing and performing each song like playing it is one thing but playing it and performing it as you play it is another and it, and it takes a second to feel these things out but uh it's just performance mode and and everything kind of falls into that yeah tell me about your gear bases and i, I know your esp bass right? i play esp bases i have an ltd signature bass which i i love uh the with JC4. some four pardon me the JC4. the JC4, yes, yes, the JC4. Uh, I cracked the secret code, what those numbers and letters mean. <laughs> it's pretty easy to figure out. Uh, the John Campbell four-string bass. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. oh, there's no secret to it. This is no uh, no Ovaltine commercial. <laughs> um, yeah, I I, uh, I one time played a three-string bass. Uh, it was my Guild Pilot, which was my first real uh, bass. Uh, and I broke a tuning peg. And I didn't really have the money to get a new tuning peg. So I'm not really using that last string on there. And I'll just grab that tuning peg. And here I am 20 plus years later talking about it. Uh, but I'm always, I, pardon me? Which one was missing? What were the three strings that you? That were well, I, I, we play a drop tune. Uh, and I broke the, the one that holds the thickest string, the fourth string. Uh, and I kind of needed that one. And I didn't need the, the, the first string so much, the G string. So I just had a bass that was DAD and just an empty slot. Uh, and it, for a while, it was it was an interview question that I knew was coming up because that was just people were somehow fascinated with that. When really the story behind it is not. No, I'm not inventing anything new. I'm just broke. I didn't even have to bring them up. You brought it up this time. Well, so we're here talking about just for bass players. I'm letting y'all in on all the bass secrets. Uh, I, I I've in light of that, I've always kind of fought five strings and just the idea of a five string like that's too many goddamn strings. sorry i don't want to start any fights here but uh so what i've done instead is i've had a four string bass set up to take thicker strings for any tunings i need to do below the drop d uh and that to me makes a lot more sense than a five string bass so hence the jc four string which i'm playing uh that also has fishman pickups in it the fishman fluence pickups uh come in the in the signature model which they're great. Uh, and it's also, uh, I'm playing the DR strings and some Dunlop picks. Coming I, out of, go ahead. 
I know you're excited about EBS. And- yeah, I was going to say, and that, that takes care of everything here. And then it goes into this AM company that I've, I've been working with EBS for a while with their pedals, using their, uh, <clears throat> their compressor pedal. And actually, I, I took the compressor pedal into a recording session with Josh Wilbur, and he got his hands on it and like lost his mind. Like, oh my God, this, this is amazing. I, do you know the people involved? In, like, and I put him in touch with the, with the guy Ralph over there. Uh, Ralph, who I've been in B- touch with. Yerbo. Yeah, yeah, old Ralph Bajerbo. Bajerbo. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Ralph. Sorry, Ralph. We know it's not that to me. It's funny because I'm silly American. But now I am officially with them in AMPS as well uh right now i've got a reed mar sitting next to my desk here that is like my my daily driver i wake up lucky enough get the kids to school <clears throat> cup of coffee come down play my warm-up songs and then get to the, the set that's uh coming up we leave in another week and a half something we're going to europe uh which unfortunately i won't get to see ralph he'll be out of he'll be out of town when we hit stockholm but yeah we're, we're about to hit the state of the unrest tour state of unrest tour with creator and municipal waste uh, which has been rescheduled so many times. This was a COVID tour. Yeah. Uh, well, that's exciting. Actually, by the time this interview posts, you will be in Europe. So okay, know. sick. I hope it's right cool. on. <laughs> well, time machine it up. Hope everything's great. There you go. I want to ask you about playing bass and learning bass. I know you have some thoughts about that and some. Uh, <laughs> For bass players only, you heard me mention at the beginning. I used to use the term old rockers. I was trying to come to something that would that that made sense. I know old rockers has kind of a wink to it. I don't know if that's going to put anybody off. Over 50 is most of what we're getting, 50s, 60s, 70s, mostly men. Oh, wow. We, we do get a fair bit of women, but they're, they're not career bound. They're not trying to you know, set the world on fire. They want to play some classic rock riffs. They want to play sure. blues shuffles. They want to play some walking bass, whatever it is. A lot of them don't even care about playing with other people. They just want to learn. Bass. I, I get it. <laughs> I do that at home all the time. Uh, One yeah. other thing, to, to set the context, another thing that comes with being in your 50s, 60s, 70s, and watch out for this, John, because it might be coming your way. I hope not too uh, <laughs> severely, but... Yeah, arthritis, tendonitis, uh, you know, pain in the neck, the back, the shoulders. A lot, a lot of people are recovering from surgery. So, in that happy context, sure, <laughs> what, sure. What advice do you have for somebody that wants to learn bass? Well, I think it's great that that the motivation is there. That it's that you feel ready to do this. It is a great thing to do, and it doesn't matter what becomes of it. Uh, when I started. I have never had any lessons. I just happen to have <laughs> some very talented people near me that I can fake it well enough to, to keep up with. But I, I also, I, I kind of knew some basics, go, basics going in, but like, as far as like hand position and those things, I didn't know anything. And I've been lucky enough to have been able to spend a lot of time and get paid to spend that time uh, learning how to play. And it turns out the correct hand position actually makes sense. It's not, you know, you don't have to punk rock it. There's a reason why that is there. And uh, that was, I guess, something as starting young, the, the ego wouldn't let me see that. And so I'm saying starting older might be a better thing. And if you do have that time, oh, my God, you're so lucky. <laughs> I still have kids in, in school. So let's uh, pause a moment for those of us such afflicted. Um, but as far as advice, you go slow and you expect that you're going to be terrible at first and then you're going to get great. You're going to get excited and then you're going to plateau and it's going to be kind of boring. But if you have like, a, I guess, like a program or like something to guide you, uh, well, I, I play, I hear songs on the radio and be like, oh shit, I want to learn how to play that bass line. And I'll, I'll hit favorite or something. And my secret is, is I, I don't want to give, promote anybody that I'm paying for their service, but I, there's a place I go to for tabs, which get me in the ballpark, but it's still, they're not going to be totally right. Um, but a lot of times... It, you, you find you can just like give a lot of these things are really simple and they all fall in the same box. It's just a matter of listening. You have to develop your listening skills and, uh, and, and again, go slow. And, and I practice with a, with a metronome. Once I know what my fingers are going to do, if it's faster than I can do, I'll slow down and, and have a metronome going into, you know, with the luxury of having the time to afford to do that kind of stuff. Sure. You know, there's, there's like, Three things I could think of that really get people riled up. You mentioned four strings versus more than four strings. <laughs> you mentioned a metronome. And I want to ask, I know you're primarily a pick player. Oh, yeah. 
So, and, and I know you, you work on your chromatic runs and things like that. Uh, do you play with a pick because the music that you play pretty much requires that? Because I think I read somewhere you said, I play with a pick, but sometimes when I'm fooling around, I like to, you know, just play with my fingers. Do sure. You, do you have a preference? So, in Richmond, when we first started, one of my um, early influences, just an amazing bass player that was here in town, was playing in a band called Keepone and singing a guy named Mike Bishop. He had been in Guar. He actually now is back in Guar as the, the lead singer. Um, this guy's fingers were insane. His technique is incredible. And I wanted to, I wanted to be able to do that. <clears throat> but uh, at one point, I broke my hand. And uh, there was somebody coming to check us out at our practice space while I had a broken hand. So I was like, well, I guess I'm going to tape a pick in my hand and see if I can't make it work. It didn't work, <laughs> but I continued forward with the pick. And um, at this point, I feel like I could not. I feel like I do better with a pick than I could ever have done with my fingers just because of the exacting precision. And I can I can make that. Like I play really hard <laughs> with a lot of attack that I guess I could also do with my fingers, but uh, like the speed that I can get with the pick, I, 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 it would be, it would be insanely difficult with your fingers. But you, you raise another thing that I, I never thought about. I have at least one student that, uh, that had a broken hand. And you know, my, my whole system for bass players only, it's a bass instruction site. It starts, I told you who the, who the audience is. Mm -hmm. And the, everything is like a theme and variations. So it could be like a four bar pattern, eight bar, 12 bar blues, whatever. And it starts real simple. And then each variation is just a little bit more advanced. than That the makes sense. Before. Yeah. So you can go at your own pace and the backing tracks with bass and without bass and control the mm -hmm. speed all that stuff so uh how did you get back eventually to being it you started with the pick and then it sounds like you know that was that was it for you when you stuck with it but is there a way that that you know therapeutically that you could develop my fingers uh not just necessarily your fingers but your hand and your bass playing ability coming from having had a broken hand it, it, ah, it was, ah. well i don't know that it was that that uh formative and that, and that eventually i think going to a pick would have been necessary i can still play with my fingers i just can't play as fast as punchy and it would take me some while to make sure that i had the fingers to get through an entire set do you ever play any in medium scale or short scale basses? Uh, no, not really. Because a, a lot of students say they, they've they tried those and they're easier on the hands and they, they like them. I, I don't like them. I can't really get used. I could probably eventually get used to them. But in, in learning how to play bass myself, uh, I uh, in the early days, like, of course, we're playing a heavy metal band. I'm going to come up on the string up the neck to play to catch those notes that are right here. But that's rock and roll. Yeah. So you needed that long neck. Um, years later, I find, oh, wait, no, shit, those sound a lot better if you play them down here. You know, get flashy if you want. But, you know, really, it sounds better and it's more efficient. Yeah. I know how it sounds, but how do I look? Yes. <laughs> oh, but this is rock and roll. I was my foot's on the, imagine my foot on the monitor right now and tell me, now, now tell me what you think. Yeah. What would you be if you weren't a bass player? You know, something outside of music, because I know you have ukes and banjos and guitars and acoustic. I, I, well, outside of music, you say, I, I, I would still be making music in some way if, if it wasn't my job professionally. It would, even if it was just in my, in my living room with a crappy acoustic guitar from, the, from a pawn shop or something. And I was in the service industry before, so I would imagine I would be, uh, I would be somehow involved in the service industry as a twice over college dropout. You mean like hospitality or something? I, like I was a bartender before the band took off, and, and college hopeful, but it, you know, it didn't that didn't pan out either. You toured with Ozfest, didn't you? We did. You know Blasco a few times. I was, met Blasco. Yeah, he's a he's a very friendly dude. Wasn't he? No, he wasn't a bartender. He he worked in a clothing store. That's oh what, yeah, no. Well, that makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot. Of the, a lot of us that are lucky enough to do music for a living, at least for parts of our lives, we, we come from all over. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad things worked out the way they did. <laughs> Thank you very much. I would, I'm, I'm with you on that.
The new album is called Omens. The band is Lamb of God. And the bass player, of course, is John Campbell. Thank you so much, John. It's great. Thank you for taking a little bit of time and catching up with us. I know our My pleasure, John. Is gonna love hearing and seeing you. The, the tour, if they're coming anywhere near you, are you going to be anywhere other than Europe for this? Well, tour? yes, we were lucky enough to grab the uh, the direct support slot for Pantera, which is going to be going on in the States in August into September. Okay, that that's why Rex is too busy to do a follow-up interview. <laughs> I funny. mean, he probably went from... He's, I can imagine Rex is insanely busy right now. And I so look forward to getting on the road with that dude and hanging out. And, oh, yeah. yeah he, he's a great dude. Yeah, I've interviewed him at least two or three times. I don't know. But Lamb of God, if they're coming in your area, your neck of the woods, check them out. The new album is Omens, Lamb of God, John Campbell, all that good stuff. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I am John Liebman. You're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. A lot of people think they're too old or it's too late for them to learn how to play an instrument. So I created for BassPlayersOnly.com. For people over 50 who want to play bass, because I believe you're never too old and it's never too late to experience the joy and the pleasure of making music. For BassPlayersOnly.com, that's what we're all about. Thanks again, John Campbell. I'm John Liebman, founder and first baseman of ForBassPlayersOnly.com. See you all next week, same time, same place. In the meantime, let's play bass.